nice to be here. It's the first time I've been to Stockholm. I've been to quite a lot of the other uh, places that management events run their conferences, and uh, they seem to keep wanting to invite me back. So hopefully you'll find it as interesting as the uh, your predecessors in other conferences. I spent 30 odd years working at Rolls-Royce Aerospace, much of the time in that gap or the space between the business needs, the business users and the IT providers. And I actually ended up, after a long career there, on a couple of business process engineering projects which taught me some very, very interesting lessons and some very, very interesting questions. Because in the field of IT, computing particularly, the answers change every year and are different in every organization. But fundamentally, over the last 50 years, those 50 years that I've been involved in this whole thing, the questions have never, ever changed. And it's kind of interesting that we still don't actually understand, or most businesses don't seem to understand the important questions that lead to good governance, the ability to achieve your business values and gain the objectives you've got ahead of you when you actually finally implement things. So I'm going to be looking at particularly the business AI side. To me, I feel the RPA side, the business robotics side, is it's got some interesting challenges to make it work and I'm sure some of the talks you've had and some of the partners outside have got some very interesting questions and guidance as to how you can get value from the RPA side, the robotics. But to me, they don't pose too significant a governance challenge other than the need to still consider change management as your fundamental project, not the business robotics. The technology across all of the emerging technologies we've got in our field of business today the technologies are essentially trivial in implementation terms. Yeah, they're slightly complicated and they are hugely expensive in many occasions. But they're not difficult to implement. The difficulty for this thing that we have now called digital transformation, that everybody is trying to achieve, the technology, as I say, is easy, expensive and quick to implement, relatively. But it's the humans, what we traditionally have called change management, that is stunningly difficult. It's not achieved, uh, attempted very well most of the time. If there's a conflict between the hardware and the technology budget and the change management budget, guess which wins? Your change management budget is going to be stolen, hand over fist, and poured into the technology. And yet. That change management, the humans, the hearts and minds of your users are fundamentally very difficult to change, but are the most important thing to change. That's the robotic side finish, folks. I want to concentrate more on the AI side, because it's much, much more interesting. The questions around it are absolutely fascinating, if we are going to be able to trust it. You see, AI has been hyped, or is now in its third hype cycle. And the latest hype cycle has lasted for maybe 15 years. And yet, there are astoundingly few really good examples of businesses gaining a lot of value from it. There are a few, and I suspect if they're where they have had success, they have asked themselves some very, very deep and fundamental questions before they even started, before they jumped in on this hyped technology or set of technologies. Now, I missed the IBM presentation this morning because I had other things to do, unfortunately. And it unfortunately was in English, um, which I understand. I don't understand Swedish, so I haven't been in any of the other sessions, unfortunately. But I know from talking to the IBM gentleman that they're posing the similar sorts of questions that I am going to be covering this, morning, this afternoon. The fundamental one is, does it work as it's intended? The second point I want to bring to your attention 
is that I'm sure many of you have got your own software development teams and you've got expert software test engineers who know how to test traditional algorithmic type systems. But do you or your teams understand what's necessary for an AI type of learning system? Because they are fundamentally very, very different. Traditionally, it's ever so easy. You look at the spec and you turn it into a whole series of steps and you know what the answer should be at the end of each step. So you create a test harness, tip your software through it and check that every test case with the input uh, data produces the correct output answer. But testing AI machine learning type of systems is very, very fundamentally different. And so I'll be exploring some of the differences and the consequences for you. Yeah, traditional, very much step by step, almost line by line of the code. You can go do software code walkthroughs to find out and make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. If you're doing uh, open source software, you put it out there and there's thousands of eyes that are looking at that code. And we can, at least in principle, although it's kind of a little bit difficult computationally, we can prove that our software, our traditional type of software, is correct or not correct. And we build up those automated test scripts as a library that every time we modify that li a bit of code inside that sh routine or something, we can rerun that test harness with that test script adjusted slightly for the change we've just put into it, that modification. And we can prove that it all works. And that's often done with uh, with uh, your business systems. But, you look at an AI or an, um, a predictive analytics type of system where you're using logistic regression or one of the uh, regression models to find out the patterns in the data that you acquired over the last six months to train up a system that can then do without people very much automate those decision, that decision-making that that data contains. The problem is, as we see here, these types of systems have been written in a traditional fashion and can be tested and proven that yes, it calculates the standard deviation correctly or whatever else it's doing. But once you then give it training data, it will find the patterns that lie therein. And it will find the patterns if there's big, a large enough amount of data, enough rows wide, columns wide, and enough rows deep, the software will inevitably find lots of patterns. Now there's a website which holds lots and lots of examples of spurious correlation, where it's found a pattern. The one that I love most and mention most is a few years ago, someone discovered that the correlation between the number of tons of fresh lemons imported into the USA from Mexico correlated perfectly. R squared equals 0.998. So that's as good a um, correlation as you could ever expect to get. It correlated perfectly with the number of road deaths in the USA per year. Clearly, absolutely no causal relationship between those two sets of data. You have 100, 100 columns of data about people. And it's easy to do this with um, credit card companies and banks who are looking at your credit card and your debit card usage they can then go through probably 100 columns worth of data about whether you are a safe or an unsafe bet for the future, and they can start reducing your credit limit and so on. It turns out that actually 
there's only one column you need to know. But the data scientists, because they love putting these loads of data through their pattern matching systems, predictive analytics, regression analysis, they will like to use all 100. And they'll get a score which is about 95% accurate. If you have an understanding of credit card usage as a domain expert, as an account manager, you know that one single column is important in understanding the risk of people's use of credit cards. The column is the one that says, how many times in the last six months has someone taken cash on their credit card through an ATM? That is the highest risk factor about people's use of credit cards because the pattern is that if you start taking money out on, against your credit card regularly, you're probably paying off something else. You don't need to have 100 columns with regression, correlation, coefficients and so on of 0.1, 0.2%. You've got this one column, 95%. You have to look at the world differently. They find the patterns. These systems are not like your traditional system where you get it and it does transactions. You have to pour huge amounts of data in for it to learn the patterns that you want it to learn, you hope. The behavior of these AI systems depends on the training. It's not the specification. It's purely the data that you provide it. And most of these systems will pick up the biases, the human biases, that underpin the data that is given to the training system. The AI system's behavior is very indeterminate until it's been trained. And like the guys from IBM said this morning, often, they're black boxes which we have absolutely no understanding of what they are doing in any individual circumstance. We understand in principle what the neural networks are doing layer by layer. That's how they're put together. But why it makes an individual decision based on the input picture or input pattern of data, we have absolutely no understanding of what it's doing and why it's chosen that output. Now, I want to go through a few rather interesting examples of failures which have become apparent over the last couple of years or so. <coughs> the first one that was interesting came from Amazon. They announced it in the week ending 14th, Wednesday the 14th of November last year, although it actually was something they had done in January 2018. They had wanted to provide a mechanism to help their HR organization process job applications, because they got lots of them for a particular uh, activity, and I guess it was probably programming. They th built a learning system, and through the last 10,000 job applications that had received into it, so it could learn how to pre-process. <coughs> After a while, they discovered to the horror that it was not the unbiased processor that they had hoped for. It turns out that it was remarkably sexist and remarkably um, racially biased. Why should we be surprised? Because that reflected the job applications and the processing of those job applications over the last few years in those 10,000. They had never employed women in that particular job role. And they had had some sort of racial uh, profile of who they had actually appointed. And the pattern recognition system discovered that. What I found very bizarre from a company like Amazon was that part of their story, they said, before they finally killed it in Jan 2018, was that they tried to change the algorithms to become less racist, less genderist which indicates they didn't even begin, the people who are telling that story about why they had a problem didn't even understand how these 
learning systems work. It had learned the patterns in the data. There was no way that you could change the algorithms without it not working as a pattern recognition system. What they should have done would be to kill that learning si learned system and retrain it on less biased data, except with this pattern recognition system, yeah, it's easy, take out the male, female, tick box, easy, no problem. Get rid of the first, the, the, the names, because in a lot of the West, names are gender related. So you can get rid of those two, and it's kind of anonymized. Trouble is, one thing we do know from many, many years of experience in HR, that the personal statement in a job application is written differently by the average woman and the average man. And the pattern recognition system would have then looked at the personal statement as a surrogate for gender. It would have said, these are the types of personal statement that get appointed. This type doesn't get appointed. Oops, that's female. Oh dear. So you couldn't actually fix this problem using pattern recognition. Now I saw on LinkedIn yesterday a system called Jim being created by a bank in uh, Singapore. And they claim it's much, much more successful. Now I suspect one of the reasons for this is that it's not a pattern recognition system. And I'll come on to what I think we might have to do uh, a bit later on. The second one is an IBM one. IBM Watson Oncology. Created with the assistance of Sloan, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, the hospital in the world that knows more about cancer diagnosis and treatment. And the marketeers thought, wow, this will be fantastic. Once we've got it working, fully trained, we'll be able to license it out around the world and make a fundamental change to all those hospitals in the world trying to do better diagnosing and treating cancer. In the end, they discovered it only works in Memorial Sloan Kettering and a few other American top-end hospitals. It doesn't work in any other part of the world. Partly it's in English, not in their local languages, but that doesn't explain why it didn't work in India. Language was not the problem. The problem was that the whole system was biased totally towards the things that Memorial Stone Kettering had available in terms of protocols, <coughs> diagnostic equipment, etc., etc., etc. Incredibly biased data in one sense and training. And we see that in many, many types of um, systems that clearly fail. Another one that was kind of interesting was the top illustration. Training a, a military system to recognize friendly and enemy tanks. They did the proper thing. Lots and lots of photos. A set of those photos reserved for testing, and it worked. The only problem was the AI had only recognized backgrounds. And it unfortunately happened that all of the enemy tanks had one background, all of the friendly tanks had the other background. It didn't know there was a thing called a tank in any of those photos. This goes back to the point that was raised, I think, uh, IBM mentioned about the dog and the wolf situation where it only knew about snow. And then, of course, face recognition. Joy Bulamwini was trying to tell her, her camera in her lab, I think MIT or one of the West East Coast uh, universities, to say hello, Joy, when she walked into her office. Unfortunately, the training data set of photos that all face recognition systems in the West are trained on only has about 2.5% of photos of dark black women. It has 75% white Caucasian males. 
It knows how to recognize our faces, but for her, her face didn't even figure in the system. It couldn't see there was a face there until she put on a, a V Vendetta white mask, and then it could see there was a face. But it couldn't see a face there. And we have a problem in the UK with the um, online application system for passports. People with black faces, black African faces, their photos are judged to be inappropriate. They're smiling when they're clearly not smiling because they've got large lips. So, and then went live knowing that about one and a half to two percent of people would have their photos rejected unre unfairly. That's raising an ethics question in the, in the press at the moment. We know about the problems with autonomous vehicles. They're going to be here in next year, according to uh, Elon Musk of Tesla, or they were saying back in the middle of last year, oh, we'll have level four fully autonomous cars. Okay, they'll have steering wheels and so on, but they'll be able to cope mostly by 2025. And then the week of the 14th of November, 2018, John Krafcik, CEO of Waymo, Google's car company, suddenly announced that this vision of 2025 is now several decades out. He said, it is many, many decades from now until cars will be self-driving in all circumstances. Huge change. Coming up uh, the same week as Uber and Lyft said they were not going to do follow only autonomous vehicles, they were going to go into movement as a service. They were buying up electric um, scooters and electric bikes, going to partnership with uh, rapid trans systems and bus systems. There are things we can do, but these are rather weird and wondrous things that are worrisome. A Chinese exercise that identifies criminality, 85, 89% accuracy, apparently, or can identify male or female homosexuals from their photos with those liquidity levels of accuracy. Is that good enough? Because I know of various jurisdictions who would be very happy to have cameras doing this sort of thing at the borders. Sorry, sir, you're gay. You can't come in. Sorry, sir, you're a criminal tendencies. You can't come into our country. Raises questions for us academics, should we be doing this stuff? But it also raises questions to you about some of the projects that you may have. Should you be doing that just because we can do it? What are the ethics of doing it? Just because we can do simple things and we can quickly train a predictive analytics machine over a weekend to do lots and lots of office automation with loan decisions, insurance policy decisions. Whereas it will take a year and a million dollars plus to do it properly with algorithmic approach, rules-based learning. Where are we going, folks? If we're going to do it for our business processes, we really have to think an awful lot more carefully. If we are going to gain the trust of both ourselves, providing the service, and our customers, we need to understand and be able to explain what the systems are doing. And under the GDPR, which we're all bound by these days in Europe, and UK if Brexit happens next week or the week after, we're still bound by it. We have to be able to explain many of these decision-making processes that our businesses have for compliance. You see, yeah, it's dead easy to do the left-hand side and very cheap and expensive to do the proper compliance provable one. We can explain the right-hand one. We can explain exactly where I fell out of the approval process because I didn't do this or I didn't do that. You can't do it with these AI black boxes. You've no idea 
what it has chosen. So, testing, we can do a lot of simulation, which is what they're beginning to do. But a more important one is this. In the world of ordinary transactional type computer systems, it doesn't actually matter too much about the social and ethnic and uh, gender diversity of our software development and testing teams to some extent. But in the world of AI, we have to have gender, ethnicity, and all the other aspects of diversity covered. Otherwise, we will not cover some of the critical things that these things will learn or will do. And then our companies will be in severe problems in terms of reputation and also potentially in terms of large fines and damages. You see, there's an example of a system being used in England in the, in the courts and in America in the courts to work out whether or not a person who's up for bail can actually be given bail. It turns out in all three areas, the questions correlate with the question of, and it's purely because of demographics, and, and culture. The questions all correlate perfectly with are you black or are you not black? Totally racist. And the people who actually created those questionnaires didn't understand the diversity and cultural aspects. These are the things you're going to have to solve if you're going to be able to test your AI and machine learning black boxes. Thank you very much. Thanks for a really fascinating speech. Are there any questions for? Uh, so, so what you, I mean, now we are like ethically enlightened, so we're many of us, so that's good. But, but I, I guess like the neural network thing will, it will just move on and will always be dominant will be out of doing it. So what, what to do? Well, The pro one of the problems is that the, at the moment, certainly in the big tech world, uh, and this came out of an interesting posting on LinkedIn this morning that I saw, that goes back partly to uh, Shoshana Zuboff's book, The Surveillance Society, but it also picks up on a lot of other aspects about tech companies, particularly West Coast tech companies, follow appear to follow a uniquely American way of looking at life that was there with the founding fathers to change and develop and move ahead of things. And so you get completely idiotic inventions, smart hairbrushes. You know, apparently for $200 you can buy a hairbrush which has little microphones in it which can listen as you brush your hair. And it'll tell you whether your hair is dry, fly away or greasy. Um, actually, I think I knew that, didn't we? Why do I need to have a hairbrush that will listen why I do that? And then it links to my phone, and the app there says, oh, yes, it's flyaway hair, and you need to do this. I need to pay $200 to buy something that can be, can be provided because we can do it. Or the $400, start off with a $1,000 juice press that read the barcode on the outside of the pack that you put inside, and it was a really beautifully engineered titanium heavyweight device that crushed the, 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 um, the bag. And if, the out, if the, it read the barcode and it was out of date, it would refuse to crush your bag. Oh, and by the way, you could get 95% of the juice out of the bag of the material, the fruit or veg, just with your own hands. You didn't need a thousand dollar. And it says so much of following the hype, following all of this. sort of thing is interestingly different. I was talking to the IBM guys. One of the things I was saying is that although <coughs> Watson 
and its cleverness is having problems with, say, oncology, because that's all word-based. In terms of genetics and in chemistry, it probably is going to be able to work, because that's independent, it's a different layer. It's not affected by humans, it's biology. Um, as long as we have enough <coughs> sorry, <coughs> understanding, and this is where it kind of gets interesting. There's a book published in Jan uh, February, which has got the Royal Society's, uh, Royal Academy's uh, Book of the Year, and it's called Invisible Women. Because so much of the time, it's the male perspective. I won't go into the whole details. If you want to read it, it's an absolutely fascinating book. But interestingly, in terms of, say, Symptoms for heart, uh, heart attack. We all know that a heart attack, you feel a pain there, and you get a pain down your left arm, don't you? Everybody? We'll agree that's what we're told. It turns out, however, that actually, most women who present or are diagnosed after the event with a heart attack have uh, presented with what are called atypical uh, symptoms. In other words, it's not the traditional pain here and a pain down the right arm. Now, it's kind of interesting, when you've got 50% of the world presenting with atypical symptoms, you kind of have to start thinking that maybe it's bimodal. There's men and there's women with a different set. There was a stunning study here, or activity here in, um, I think it was in Stockholm, a few years ago, uh, looking at the question of snow plowing. It's obvious you snow plough the main routes, don't you? Because you're on your buses and your cars, you get to where they need to get to. It's obvious. That happens everywhere. Interesting, I think it was here. Someone said, jokingly almost on the council said, is it the right thing to be doing? And they started having a look. And they started thinking, actually, if we look at getting to work, that's mostly are significantly a male thing. What about what do the females do? Well, some of them are going to work and need to get on the buses and get there. But there's an awful lot, particularly the younger ones, with families who need to go not to work, but they're going maybe to school. All the sort of things locally. So they thought, okay, let's see what happens. It's not going to cost us any different if we snowplow the main routes or we snowplow residentially sort of areas. Did that. And then they discovered most interestingly the amount of money they spent on snow ploughing and clearance with the new regime, pavements and residential areas and sort of local shopping areas, they were suddenly saving three times that amount on their health system in the winter. Because as the, the woman who wrote the book observed, they weren't getting so many women with broken pelvises and broken legs. They were being able to put, because you can, yeah, you can drive through three inches, six centimeters, seven centimeters of snow relatively easily. You try, gentlemen, pushing your grandkids' buggy through three inches of snow. It's a bit difficult, isn't it, ladies? If not impossible. And there are so many of these things which just baked into society, because we have a kind of gendered but ungendered humankind equals mankind in English. And there's all sorts of things that come from that, apparently, that require us to change the way we look at things. Very, very fundamental. Even some of the data we have to capture, to categorize our data, to be able to understand better what is atypical or not atypical. Does that help? Thank you. Well, I'm sorry, I really think we have to round up. Yeah. Thanks once again for a very, very passionate speaking. Thank you very much. Thank you.